We are so fortunate in Ontario to have four distinct seasons. Now I know there are some winter haters out there, and I too have been there, peeking out of the window, just waiting for winter to go away. I spent an entire year in Australia, where when we have our summer, they have their winter, and when we have our winter, they have their summer. During the Australian winter, I was wearing a t-shirt and shorts and swimming in the ocean. I felt so lucky to be able to go through an entire year without having to go through a Canadian winter. I actually felt sorry for my friends and family back home who were enduring the freezing cold temperatures, the mountains of snow, all of the slush and the freezing rain. But you know, by the time the next winter rolled around and I was back in Canada, I was really missing winter. I decided to have a different mindset. To see my homeland the way that a tourist sees it. To look for all of the interesting things to do and the really cool places to see in my own backyard. I fully embraced winter and I found out the secret to enjoying it. This is my pro tip for enjoying winter. Get into activities that you can only do in winter. Things like skiing, snowshoeing, dog sledding, ice climbing, skating, tobogganing, and building super cool snow forts. Winter is also one of my favorite times for wildlife tracking. Fresh snow provides a clean canvas to capture the movement and the stories of the wildlife around us. One of my favorite things to do in winter is to go out and find the tracks of a large mammal, like a moose or a bear or a wolf or a deer or a coyote, and then go out and just follow the trail. And it's amazing the beautiful places the animal can lead me, as well as how much I can learn about that animal and how it interacts with the world around it. One more pro tip for enjoying winter, make sure that you dress appropriately. There is no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. It's kind of cold. I absolutely love winter now, and I am so grateful that I get to experience it. I'm also amazed at how so many living things can survive the harsh conditions of winter. Atlantic salmon, for example, their eggs are laid in cold water streams in November, and those eggs don't only survive, but they develop in water that is just barely above freezing. Atlantic salmon, like other cold water fish species, require low water temperature. If the water temperature gets too warm, then eggs, eyed eggs, alvin, fry, par, smolt, and adults can all start to die. Our climate, with our cold winters, creates conditions that are necessary for Atlantic salmon survival. Of course, Atlantic salmon need more than just cold water to survive. This week, we're going to be learning about the habitat requirements of Atlantic salmon from Elizabeth, one of our OFAH Fitzsimmons Fish and Wildlife Conservation interns. Then we're going to hear another fishy fact from Johnny. But before we get into all of that, let's check on our hatcheries. Checking on tank number one. Filter, check. Air pump, check. And our temperature is three degrees Celsius. Having a look at our eggs, we can see that they are still eyed eggs and that they all look healthy. Tank one is good. Let's check on tank number two. Filter, check. Air pump, check. And our temperature is just a touch under eight degrees Celsius. And looking at our eggs, they are still eyed eggs. It might be hard for you to see, but to me, the little fish inside are looking a bit more defined. We do have three eggs that are a snow white color. 
these eggs have died. Now this happens. It is perfectly natural, and as long as it doesn't happen to a bunch more, it is not of concern at this time. I will keep a closer eye on them though. We have three that have died, but 97 healthy ones in this tank. Both tanks are in good shape. I'm gonna now turn it over to Elizabeth, and then followed by a fishy fact with Johnny. Hi everyone. My name is Elizabeth Gallant, and I work for the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters as the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Intern. And today, I wanna to talk to you about the habitat of Atlantic salmon. So let's get started. A habitat refers to the environment needed for an organism to survive and reproduce. All organisms need the same four components to survive. Food, water, space, and shelter, all of which can be arranged in a variety of ways. Atlantic salmon, like you and me, need food, water, cover, and space to survive. Cover, like gravel, rocks, and trees, helps protect Atlantic salmon from predators like birds and other fish. Atlantic salmon also need food to eat, clean, cold water to keep them healthy, and space to migrate. Atlantic salmon have two main habitats throughout their life cycle. Cold water streams, where they hatch and live as young and return to reproduce, and Lake Ontario, where they migrate to to feed and grow into adults. Atlantic salmon begin their lives in cold water streams with gravel bottoms and fast moving water. Cold water streams are streams that are fed by cold groundwater that flows up from the ground, meaning that they remain cold all year. And since they don't rely solely on precipitation, cold water streams often flow when other streams are dry. In the gravel at the bottom of cold water streams, Atlantic salmon dig their nests, which are called reds. Once they construct their reds, they deposit their eggs, which a male Atlantic salmon will fertilize. The female Atlantic salmon then covers the eggs with gravel, which protects them from predators and keeps them from washing away downstream. Atlantic salmon are very particular when choosing where to construct their reds. They choose clean water, which prevents sediments like dirt and plant materials from building up on the eggs, which would keep them from getting oxygen. And speaking of oxygen, Atlantic salmon also construct their reds in the shallow, fast-moving parts of the stream, called riffles. The fast-moving water helps keep the eggs oxygen oxygenated by producing small waves, which carry oxygen into the water and to the eggs. And to survive to adulthood, juvenile Atlantic salmon need cold water, gravel, trees, and connectivity. Juvenile Atlantic salmon spend the first one to three years of their lives in cold water streams before they smolt and migrate downstream. Smolting is a change that Atlantic salmon go through to prepare them to migrate downstream and enter saltwater oceans. During this process, Atlantic salmon will turn a nice silvery color, as you can see in the picture of the bottom fish here. And even though Atlantic salmon in Ontario migrate to Lake Ontario, and not a saltwater ocean, they still go through this smoltification process. And just as a quick reminder, I thought we'd go through the life cycle of an Atlantic salmon, since I'll be referring to some of these terms throughout the presentation. Atlantic salmon start as eggs, which hatch in cold water streams. The hatched eggs, called alevin, feed off their yolk sac for several weeks before developing into fry, which leave the gravel and begin to swim around. After several months, the fry develop into par, which develop these finger-like markings on their side. At one to three years old, Atlantic salmon will begin the smoltification process and migrate to Lake Ontario, where they'll spend one or more winters before returning to their original stream to spawn. So back to habitat, temperature is an important characteristic for juvenile Atlantic salmon. Salmon are cold water fish, meaning that they require the temperature of the water to be quite cool for them to survive. Juveniles need cold water because unlike humans, fish are cold-blooded. This means that fish can't regulate their body temperature. Instead, their body temperature matches the temperature of the environment around them. So in warm water, their body temperature increases, which causes them to digest their food much faster than they would in cold water. And this causes the fish to need to eat more food, which might not always be available. So it's really important that Atlantic salmon have cold water. 
Trees are another important habitat feature because their shade blocks the sun and helps to keep the cold water streams cold. Large branches and trunks that fall into the water become structural cover for Atlantic salmon. They also create pools of slow moving water where juveniles can rest. And smaller twigs and leaves are also important because they become food for small organisms like benthic invertebrates, which then become food for fish. Trees also help in a way that might not always be visible to us. The large root systems of trees help hold the soil in place along the shoreline, meaning that they can keep the water clean by preventing the shoreline from eroding. So juvenile Atlantic salmon also require gravel and rocks in their environment. Not only does gravel protect Atlantic salmon eggs from predators and strong currents, it's also the habitat of the main food source of juveniles, which are benthic invertebrates. Benthic macroinvertebrates are organisms that live on the bottom of a water body and don't have a backbone. These include dragonfly and stonefly larvae, mayfly and caddisfly larvae, aquatic beetles, worms, and many others. Larger rocks, like cobble and boulders, are also important to juveniles because fry and par use them to hide from predators like birds and other fish. The large rocks also create pools of slower moving water, which creates areas for the fish to rest. So after one to three years in their stream habitat, Atlantic salmon smolt migrate downstream to Lake Ontario, where they'll have more space to grow and find food. For adult Atlantic salmon, space is very important. Most adult Atlantic salmon live in saltwater oceans. However, Atlantic salmon in Ontario migrate to the freshwater of Lake Ontario. And Lake Ontario is a suitable habitat because of its size and depth. Since it's so large, adult Atlantic salmon have enough space to grow and find food. And the depth of Lake Ontario also allows them to reach the cold, oxygen-rich water that they depend on. So after one to three years in their lake habitat, Atlantic salmon will migrate back upstream to the stream where they hatched so that they can spawn. And here, the Atlantic salmon life cycle starts again. So throughout the Atlantic salmon life cycle, habitat connectivity is essential for Atlantic salmon to be able to move between their stream and lake habitats. Atlantic salmon require streams that are free of unpassable man-made barriers like dams or culverts. Dams can completely block upstream migration, which can prevent adults from reaching their spawning habitats. They can also injure smolts which are migrating downstream over the dam. And while not all man-made structures prevent Atlantic salmon from migrating, they can still impact habitat quality by disrupting natural processes like the movement of woody debris and nutrients downstream. When talking about Atlantic salmon habitat, some features are more obvious than others. We can clearly see the gravel and rocks that Atlantic salmon use to hunt and hide, and we know that they need connectivity to migrate between their habitats. However, we don't always see the role that healthy wetlands play in Atlantic salmon habitat. A wetland is an ecosystem that is saturated by water for at least part of the year. There are many types of wetlands, including swamps, bogs, marshes, and fens. And water enters these wetlands through rain and snow, groundwater, and surface water flow. Wetlands have many important roles in the watershed. They reduce floods and droughts by storing water from snow and rainfall and releasing it when things get dry. They also provide critical habitat for fish and wildlife including many fish species, reptiles, amphibians, birds, insects, and even mammals. Wetlands also play a critical role in the health of cold water streams by filtering, storing, and releasing clean, cold water. As water enters the wetland, aquatic plants, soil, and organisms filter sediments, excess nutrients, and pollutants out of the water. Clean water then gets released into streams or stored as cold groundwater, which slowly releases into what we know as cold water streams. This means that wetlands create the clean, cold water streams that are essential to Atlantic salmon, which is why we must do our part to protect and restore them. So overall, the habitat of Atlantic salmon is pretty complex. 
Juveniles spend most of their time in cold water streams made up of clean, cold water, gravel and other rocks, and trees. As smolts, Atlantic salmon migrate to Lake Ontario where they'll feed and grow into adults before returning to their original cold water stream to spawn. For Atlantic salmon to complete their life cycle, habitat connectivity and healthy wetlands are essential. On another note, I wanted to talk to you about my career path and how I started working for the OFAH. My love for wildlife and the outdoors started at a very young age, as my parents took me and my sisters on camping trips across Ontario. Every summer we would go to Murphy's Point, a small Ontario park near my hometown. I remember spending hours upon hours every trip searching through the long grass on the shoreline. I was always so fascinated by the frogs and snakes that seemed to only appear as you peered closely into the water. I also remember my favorite TV channel being Animal Planet, where I would watch shows about animals across the world. For a while, I thought I wanted to be a vet, so I decided to get some experience with large mammals. I joined the 4-H Veterinary Club, volunteered at a horse ranch, and the Tay Valley Dairy Farm where I would pretty much just hang out with the kittens and calves. So when it was time to choose my education path, I knew that it'd be related to the outdoors. And so I found myself at Trent University, where I got my bachelor's degree in biology and environmental science. And not only does Trent have an amazing campus located right beside the Otonabe River, but it's also really cool because depending on your particular interests, you can choose two majors, like chemistry and biology, or business and English, and make a joint major out of them. So with my degree, I was able to learn about biology and environmental science at the same time. And during my program, I learned so much about what I already loved. I got to learn about herpetology, which is the biology of reptiles and amphibians, and entomology, which is the biology of insects. I was also able to take classes on plant biology, forestry, wetland ecology, and so many other amazing topics. In my final year of school, I got accepted into Trent's Conservation Biology Specialization, where I got to work with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, studying stream flow in a river near, near Sault Ste. Marie. I also started reaching out to my teaching assistants, who were researching really cool things like caribou, wild turkeys, and flying squirrels. I eventually got in contact with the research biologist Jeff Bowman, who hired me to research flying squirrels in the summer after I graduated. So this summer, I spent my days and nights studying flying squirrels in the Kawartha Highlands. There are two species of flying squirrels, the northern flying squirrel, which you can see at the top right here, and the southern flying squirrel, which is at the bottom right. And flying squirrels are really important to forest ecosystems because they actually eat mushrooms and other fungi like truffles, and disperse their seeds, or spores, throughout the forest through their droppings. But because of climate change, their home range and feeding patterns are being disrupted, which could impact the network of mushrooms and fungi in the forest. So we wanted to see what the squirrels were eating, what they were doing during the day and night, and how much food was available to them. So to do this, we trapped squirrels at night to see where they were hanging out, tracked them using radio collars, and collected fecal samples to see what they were eating. And we also performed mushroom and truffle surveys to see where this food source was available and how much. And overall, this great summer experience emerged from reaching out to people with similar interests to me. So making connections really doesn't need to be difficult. It's simply about finding people with similar interests and starting a conversation with them. So wherever you choose to go after school, whether it be university, college, an apprenticeship, or any other career path, I encourage you to find people who like the same things as you and start a conversation. So after my summer job, I got a job with Lanark County as a climate environmental intern. And in this role, I work to bring different climate actions to Lanark County, including electric vehicles, composting programs, and energy efficient homes and buildings. So after that position, I landed my current job as a Fish and Wildlife Conservation Intern with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. This job is funded by Fitzsimmons Financial and offers great opportunities for young biologists such as myself. During this job, I'll be working with fish and wildlife professionals on a range of policy and conservation programs, 
including the Community Hatchery Program, the Invading Species Awareness Program, and the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program. So after a lifetime of loving the outdoors and four years of learning about it, I finally landed a job where I could work to protect it with the OFAH. So I wanted to thank you all for listening today and I hope you enjoy the rest of the classroom hatchery videos. Hello everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Fishy Facts. I'm Johnny Nene and this week we're going to look at a species of fish from the other side of the world, the mudskipper. Let's take a look. Mudskippers are small tropical fish that are found in brackish and salt water in Asia, East Africa, and Northern Australia. Brackish water occurs when fresh and salt water mixes together. Mudskippers inhabit mud flat and mangrove swamp ecosystems and typically feed on algae, insects, and other small crustaceans. They have elongated bodies which can reach up to 30 centimeters long and big protruding eyes that are set near the top of their head. They can be silver or gray to greenish brown in color ranging from dark to light. Mud skippers are often found on mud instead of in water. They may spend up to three quarters of their life on land and they have some cool adaptations that allow them to survive out of water. First, a fish out of water still needs oxygen and mud skippers have specialized adaptations that allow them to absorb oxygen and store air in their gills. They can absorb oxygen through their skin, mouth and throat. Second, they have specialized pectoral fins which they use to help them move across land in an action called crutching, similar to a person who uses crutches to help them walk. However, mud skippers must avoid drying out and must remain moist at all times. To do this, they dig deep burrows in the mud which not only help them to remain moist but help them to regulate their body temperature, avoid aquatic predators during high tides and it's where females lay their eggs. Mud skippers must maintain their burrows throughout the day as the tide rises and falls by excavating excess mud. To persuade females to lay eggs in their burrow, male mud skippers may perform acrobatic jumps, push-ups, and posturing. They can jump up to two feet in the air. Male mud skippers during this time will develop brightly colored spots on their bodies which help to attract females and they will often engage with other males in territorial disputes. Once a female has chosen her mate, she follows him into the burrow where she lays hundreds of eggs. The male fertilizes the eggs and the female leaves soon after while the male remains to guard the burrow. Mud skippers are pretty unique fish and their land-based traits set them apart from most other fish species. Have you ever seen a mud skipper skip? They use their tails to help them skip along the ground, which is where they get their name. And I hope you guys enjoyed learning about the mud skipper this week. Be sure to tune into the next episode where I'll be giving you some more cool and exciting fishy facts on a new species. Thanks, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for teaching us about Atlantic salmon habitats. And thanks, Johnny, for teaching us about mud skippers. In our next episode, we're going to be learning about the native range of Atlantic salmon, when and how they came into Lake Ontario, and some of the importance that this fish has had to some different cultures. From Chris Robinson, the manager of Fish and Wildlife Conservation Programs here at the OFAH. Until then, keep on swimming upstream.